Well, it is so nice to meet you. And Felicia, please, uh, you know, welcome. Your work with Gender Descent is amazing. And we're going to have a conversation about that. I understand that you cannot be uh, completely revealed. Can you give a little bit about what that is? Because you'll be my first guest that has had to uh, be careful in this manner. Well, I am involved uh, somewhat in the arts community. Mm -hmm. I'm a creator in the arts community and I work with various other creators and I must remain anonymous. I use a different name here. I've chosen Rembrandt and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've even wondered if I might like to change my name officially because I like this so much better than my actual original <laughs> name. But because of that, the creative community in uh, Canada and Vancouver is entirely uh, taken over by queer stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. and I can't I can't risk the deplatforming and canceling of creative projects that I'm involved in with other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, boy, has that happened? Well, I am so happy to be speaking with you. Um, the Gender Descent website, which will be um, very prominent in this whole time that we speak, I got turned on to that. I think it was in September, late September of 2021. And I know that you, I know that it's Canadian. I know that you popped up in August and wow, you, you came on with a, and I'm saying you, but really I'm talking about how many women at this point are, is gender descent. When we began, we were seven. Mm -hmm. um, we have lost a few. Um, we are now a core group of four people. Mm -hmm. um, but we also use uh, what we call external writers. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. I'm always soliciting and searching for people who are not part of our group to write for us. Mm -hmm. And But as a core group, we're just four. And one of them is uh, does some writing and is our webmaster. And one of them does some writing, but is our major tweeter, mm. as, well as, as well as being a graphic artist. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that the website got launched so that you can attack different kinds of aspects of what's going on with the gender industry, if you will, and that money and being behind the money, much as Jennifer Billick's work with the 11th Hour blog, you're looking at the money that has driven things, you know, bills, um, parliamentarians, uh, you know, in Canada, everything is around Canada. So you're saying you are, are you soliciting for writers in general that are Canadian? Canadian writers, yeah. Mm -hmm. And yes, with all the different articles that you've had, it's interesting. So August 29th, you launched, I think there were three articles. One was a part one and a part two. And I was looking at the other articles that had to do with the money, um, and then all of a sudden, somebody who I have a lot of respect for and have spoken with directly myself, uh, a young woman named Aline Cormier. Have I pronounced yep. her name correctly? I always yes. get, I get that slightly off. Um, she and I have met in Zoom and everything and had these discussions about branding and film and, you know, criticisms and things like that. She really has come a long way. And, and her article that you included and I understand it's in the arts and culture tab, I think right now of your website, but it does pop up under the homepage as well. But here are all of these very political articles and she has been focusing on the roles of women and um, you know how Hollywood views women. Of course, mostly it's not great. And she just did a, a critique about a Netflix series you know, called Inventing Anna, which was super popular. I just caught up on it recently myself. And I thought, wow, the website is really, you know, expanding. And I see that the views and everything have come in. So you and I talked a little bit before, you know, recording this, but please tell me what, what do you feel is the goal at this point with the website? How do you see possibly expanding it? And inviting somebody like a writer like Aileen, whose work is starting to get seen more, but it doesn't directly have to do with, in most people's minds, money. But you and I know that it very much does. Could you talk about mm -hmm. that piece and why you decided to have that and, and some more about the website in general and your goals and your mission? 
Well, we began the website um, under the influence of Jennifer Billick. You know, and you've mentioned mm. uh, when we were talking earlier, the, the 11th hour blog. Our intention was to join Jennifer Billick in an international endeavor mm. involving one website, an international website in following the money, mm -hmm. which would have tabs for different countries. Mm. So mm. we were for nine months or so, we attended Zoom calls with Jennifer Billick and with some people in Britain. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the plan. Um, and some of us started, um, I and another member of our team started writing articles in anticipation. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, it just, uh, it wasn't feasible. So that was in August and we were having a federal election in Canada in September. Mm. And um, all of the gender ideology stuff, the gender industry, all mm. of the self ID, all of that stuff happened in Canada, came out of <clears throat> wherever it had been incubating, um, it came after Justin Trudeau's election and the Liberal government of Canada winning the election. And so this election was. Um, potentially going to put him out of power mm -hmm. and um, potentially the conservatives um, would win and there were reasons to believe now i have never voted conservative in my life you know i'm always left leaning but um you know anybody who knows anything about the impact of gender ideology on on the country on society on people and especially on women and even more especially on children knows that this has to stop and if that means um kicking the ruling liberal party out then that's what has to happen so we wanted to have our website up in advance of the election and one of our team who goes by the name of blue jay um she just took it underhand you know and and in, in within two weeks she had that website up wow and we got our first three articles and two she was one of the people who had started writing in anticipation mm -hmm. of being on an international website she wrote the two articles on the canadian government mm -hmm. and what they had done to get bill c-16 the process by which bill c-16 which is the culprit legislation mm -hmm. came into being so she her two articles were up there and another article on um i think it was called hi sam by uh cincy on um the intrusion of gender ideology into the education system mm -hmm. so we had three uh, plus we had a little article um informing people about how bills become law in Canada for anybody who wanted to read that to fully understand Blue Jay's two articles. Mm -hmm. So the, the reason why we did it so quickly and why we did it right then is to take advantage of an election to inform Canadians because Canadian media is doing nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing to inform the public. Mm -hmm. In fact, our national broadcaster, the Canadian Broadcast Corporation, is in, in terms of gender ideology, it's just a propaganda arm of the government. Mm -hmm. So since we were under Jennifer's influence and we were going to do what uh, Jennifer was doing in the States, we intended to follow the money. But we also knew that in Canada, it's, there are no giant corporations funding all of this. And um, gender ideology is being driven primarily by the government. So we knew that a bunch of our articles are going to be about government. So initially we divided, um, we pre prepared to divide our articles into those that follow the money and those that um, follow the government, what the government's doing. Uh, but um, we've uncovered about what's now seven years worth of information, right? Because the liberal government was elected in late 2015. They got put into power in early 2016. They introduced a uh, bill c-16 which added gender identity and gender expression to the human rights act they put that forward in may of 2016 you see they weren't wasting any time and that bill became law in early 2017. Mm -hmm. so that's the beginning for us in canada mm -hmm. um and we've been uncovering stuff we've all almost all, almost all of our articles start 
back in 2015 or 2016 and trace the history of something to where it is now. So that's five or six years. And I think we've done we've done a lot of that work and there's there's not going to be a whole bunch more of that work. Plus, there's just so much more, you know, as I have been investigating everything that I can about gender ideology and the gender industry, I am discovering that it's like a tangled ball mm -hmm. of six to eight, maybe 10 different threads that are in there all tangled up. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's philanthropy, there is uh, the whole pharmaceutical and medical industrial complex aspect, there's government, there's the investment industry. And, you know, I, as I pointed out in one of my articles, um, the making of Tranada, if you have an investment company like BlackRock, you know, they have how many trillions of dollars that they need to invest on behalf of clients. Well, they have a fiduciary duty to invest that money in stocks and bonds that will in companies that will have the best chance of a good return mm -hmm. and what products or services offer the best chance of the best return well that's a rhetorical question i will tell you anything addictive mm -hmm. so tobacco's gone you know they can no longer trust in the whole to in their investments in the whole tobacco industry because it has been so reduced from what it was before they tried with opio opioids mm -hmm. but you know in america the suffering i think was too visible and so the purdue pharmacy which produced those opioids it's not gone bankrupt right they were unsuccessful and i you know it's not just pharmacies it's investors looking for places to invest so that's a that's a fourth thread that's in there and then and then there is uh, the whole sex addiction mm -hmm. that's associated with men who claim to be women mm -hmm. in particular mm -hmm. and that's and and peripherals i mean cross dressers and um possibly pedophiles and a whole bunch of what i would think of as quite unsavory addictive sexual behavior you're and talking you put, pornography being yes a pornography as well yeah thank you mm -hmm. i forgot that yeah. one so you know that's number six so we need to investigate and explore all six or eight foundational pathologies mm -hmm. and industries mm -hmm. um and then we can add um we can add and you mentioned our um, new arts and culture uh, section mm -hmm. with this wonderful article on Netflix's nine part series, Inventing Anna. Hollywood, you know, Hollywood and the entertainment industry is all of there supporting trans ideology. Mm -hmm. So um, I had been following Aileen's um, film review articles. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed her perspective she always talked about what does a female viewer get from this film or how will a female viewer view this film and i you know that's not done in movie reviews and i think it should be and i find it so refreshing that it is in her work so um she approached us i think to say she um, might might want to write a piece about um the trans influence in movies Mm -hmm. It may be that one of our group contacted her first because we are very few people in Canada, mm -hmm. very few, and we all know each other either online or in person. Mm -hmm. So whichever way it happened, um, I got in touch with Aileen. I'm the editor. I edit everything that appears mm -hmm. in Gender Descent. We talked back and forth. Um, she then said she was interested in doing something about um, um, inventing Anna. And I had just been watching it on Netflix. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was that was really a happy coincidence because I'd watched the first four or five episodes, so I knew what she was talking about. Mm -hmm. And um, then before she finished writing it, I watched all nine episodes. And 
I had been drawn to it. You know why? Mm. Because of the horrible accent <laughs> that Anna has. You know, I wasn't sure whether I liked the series or not. Mm -hmm. But her accent was so horrible. And I, I have a background in linguistics, amongst other things. And, and I, the, that was an accent that belonged to no known language. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, but it was good because I was able to understand what she was talking about. And I was able to um, give her some effective, I think, editorial feedback. Mm -hmm. and, um, and to see the value of this as a means of broadening our scope at gender descent, as a means of, of attacking a, another thread, that in addition to being the first film review mm -hmm. under a brand new category of arts and culture, it was also the longest article that we've ever published. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're watching to see how many people view it. And when the analytics come in next month, I'll be checking to see whether people stayed on the site for at least 15 minutes because it's rated as a 15 minute read mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and um and we'll we're going to add another op-ed page in which we're going to do less journalistic investigation kind of stuff which has been our focus and um more analysis at it i hate to use the word opinion because Opinion can be, you know, any Tom, Dick or Harry can throw out an mm -hmm. opinion and, and it's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of opinion pieces being written by people all around the world, you know, about gender ideology and often I think, so what, mm -hmm. you know, we're preaching to the converted, we all know that it's bad, mm -hmm. but there can be an analysis, an opinion, an opinion based analysis that's also um, uncovering underlying features you know mm -hmm. like these underlying threads in mm -hmm. the tangled knot so mm -hmm. we're going to have an op-ed section and um i've written a piece um you may find this interesting we are we we are focused on canada and inventing anna is not canadian film netflix is not a canadian company but the author aileen cormier was canadian mm -hmm. and that's um so that was how we attached it to to the Canadian perspective. Mm -hmm. But you may be interested to know, or your viewers may be interested to know, that one of the founders of transgenderism and transhumanism, Martin Rothblatt, has become a Canadian citizen. Mm -hmm. So he is now within our Canadian content guidelines. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, there will be a new piece this week. I'm surprised I'm sure. it took him this long, really. I thought that he would have done that in 2015, at least 16. Something well, like I don't know when. I have um, I've d I conducted a search to try and find out when he became a Canadian citizen, but it turns out that these are personal matters and, and there's no public records of when people become Canadian citizens. Mm, interesting. Well, I just love the piece. Uh, again, we're talking about the inventing Anna piece because with things that something like this that you and I are involved in, it's a very tiny world, right? In the realm of what most people in the world are spending time looking at, think about, understand. I mean, most ordinary people that I speak to or, you know, just out in the world, they don't know anything about this, so they would never think about going to the gender descent website. But as we were talking earlier, you know, if somebody wants to know more about inventing Anna, or they want to look at anything involved with Netflix, your website can end up popping up, and and Aline's name is going to be is going to become, you know, much more popular. And then what does that do? As you were saying, there's so many angles of this. And the arts and entertainment, myself being on the West Coast, I know quite well, and coming from L.A. originally, I know quite well how Hollywood spits out music, gaming industry, which is a lot in the Bay Area, of course, because of, of, of computer technology and all of that coming around, AI, everything. Um, we have to use whatever we can at different points to pull different audiences in so that they understand the dangers of what's coming 
to their front door or what's already been in their house coming off of their screens that they haven't really analyzed, they haven't really looked at, they haven't seen the patterns of something like using an act, uh, using an actor who's pretending to be a woman, a female character, as lean clearly focuses, you know, points this out, that most audiences are just being groomed, whether it's about music or the visuals or anything, to accept these fakers as truly being women in some way. And it's just continually hammering in that message to get us to be so confused uh, because somebody's pulling off these, you know, secondary visual sex characteristics and something like that you wouldn't think is going to lead to all these other articles, the research, the, I would say hundreds of hours that goes into the work and the research that all of your people, you know, have already been working on. I, I see that you've got somebody that I've been a, a big fan of was one of my favorite people, Kathleen Lowry, you know, um, early on, because I had a, I have an interest in, in cultural anthropology and I did study that at Mills college in, uh, in, in Oakland and got into urban anthropology specifically. And I was really thrilled. Of course, I found out about Kathleen because of her, the harassment she was getting at the university. And although I haven't spoken with her directly, we've shared things online, but I find her to be absolutely brilliant. And I wondered if you could, you know, throw out anything since we were talking about these different angles and aspects of things, the article that she wrote, um, can you speak to me about that at all and why it was included? Well, um, this is an article that we reprinted and we asked her if we could reprint it. It had appeared first in Feminist Current. You must be familiar with that. Absolutely. Outlet, right, Megan Murphy's um organization. So we asked her if we could reprint it. And I particularly liked it because she talks about the importance of journalism and journalists mm -hmm. in in uncovering what's going on with the gender identity and the gender mm -hmm. industry. And basically she's saying academics, you know, can't talk about it because they've they've all been co-opted. Mm -hmm. And they're typically the people who discuss um, what she calls structural inequities and structural issues which is like class and race and so on um and and her the her ba the basic thesis of this piece is is that we can't really rely on a structural analysis because it is actual individual people mm -hmm. agents who are driving gender identity and gender ideology forward and it has to be um, independent journalists who are uncovering it so it's all about individual people at the one end. Individuals are pushing it and individuals need to uncover it. Mm -hmm. It's definitely not left, right. It's not political in that sense. Gender ideology has nothing to do with socialism. Um, but there are, it's not, wait, when you talk about things like Arcus, okay, I just said things, a really dumb word things. I'm reluctant to call Arcus a philanthropic organization because I think of them simply as the marketing department mm -hmm. of um, the Stryker Medical Industrial Organization. Mm -hmm. You know, their job is to go out and create a market. Mm -hmm. How do you create a market? You get people addicted to your product. Mm -hmm. um, so when we have huge organizations like Arcus and the Open Societies Foundation, is it still correct to talk only about individuals or is there some kind of structure behind mm -hmm. all of this? Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the answer is, but again, I think we need to talk about all of these things. We need to talk about the individuals. We need to talk about the organizations who profit from and peddle these things. The Liberal Party of Canada Mm -hmm. has been in power often, possibly more often than the Conservatives. And the Liberal Party of Canada, I've heard it described years ago as, as a non-ideological party, mm -hmm. more or less centrist, not dominated by any particular kind of ideology. Mm -hmm. So pragmatic. And our Conservative Party is, yeah, uh, right wing, but it has always been more financially and economically 
conservative rather than the social conservatism that you have in the states mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. our conservative party has never been that ideologically involved especially not socially mm -hmm. though there are elements in the canadian prairies which uh, is the rural part of canada and the most conservative part of canada there are various individuals and some pockets of extreme right-wing stuff that would that that would match you know trumpism is but they've never excuse me but that is that connected to religion in any way well there is some um conservatives tend to be religious christian christian okay. religion liberals are there's probably a higher much higher percentage of um, agnostics amongst liberals the liberals were traditionally um the party that new immigrants would vote for like i think the democrats are in the same position down in the u.s and then we have the ndp which is the new democratic party and you might think of that as fringe it has never ever been in power but it is more left-wing okay if the liberals are cent centrist non-ideological the ndp is has a social program in mind it has certain socialist ideologies mm -hmm. and if they have enough members of parliament which is what we call the elected officials if the, if there are enough ndp members of parliament they can have a certain amount of power okay we can have a minority government or a majority government. If the reigning power does not have enough seats to govern, they can still govern if they get the support of the minor parties. And the biggest minor and most important minor party is the New Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. You know, you brought up about the, B, uh, the bill C-16 before. Could you describe that briefly? And let's explore some of that and what's come of that. This was a, a bill that was among the first bills that um, Justin Trudeau introduced after he was he and the Liberal Party were elected in 2015. Um, and and it's it's a it's a an iteration of a bill that the new democratic party the left-wing party had been trying to um, get passed ever since 2006. Um, they never could get it passed because um the ruling party at that time was a conservative party under stephen harper um the liberal party never campaigned at all about uh, gender ideology nothing nothing at all there was not a peep about it but they got elected in 2015 um by may of 2016 they had announced uh there would be a bill that would be discussed in parliament adding gender identity and gender expression to the human rights act and this was a private member's bill i we're still puzzling about this because it was not a bill introduced by the ruling party by the liberal party instead they allowed a new democratic party bill which was put forward as a private members bill and this is allowed when people who are not part of the ruling party want to put a bill forward it's called a private members bill and usually it just gets dumped you know it gets a little air time and it gets dumped but the liberals for some reason this was the route that they chose so uh, it was a private member's bill put forward by a member of the New Democratic Party, but the government announced by May, which is less than six months after they'd been elected, mm -hmm. that they were going to usher this through Parliament. Mm -hmm. um, and it went through. It was uh, passed uh, and became law in early 2017. And they used, and this is one of the absolutely horrible things that this ideology does and that progressives are doing which is they pick a minority person as the front mm -hmm. okay so the you may remember i think this made international news justin trudeau said half his cabinet was going to be women mm -hmm. and why because it's 2015. Mm -hmm. so the justice minister jody wilson raybold was a woman and she's indigenous mm. 
So she was in charge of this bill and it's credited to her as the justice minister, this new bill. And of course, you know, it entirely throws women and especially with regards to prisons, indigenous women under the bus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, now we were all informed that this was a, just a, it was a minor thing. You know, it was to make sure that people employed by the federal government or people living in federal government housing would not be discriminated against. You know, that was all it was supposed to do. Well, it's, it, it, it is now known as the self ID law and, and it, it's used as a means for um, any man who claims to be a woman has to be regarded as a woman. It is now discriminatory to call him not a woman. It's completely. How did it jump from the housing issue, though, with the to self ID? What you don't mean? How did it jump from the housing issue? How did it jump from a bill that was only supposed to affect people um, in a relationship with the federal government, okay. either through housing or employment? Okay. I don't know. I have no clue. But <laughs> the. Apparently, what I have since discovered is that we have provinces in Canada, okay, mm -hmm. not states, but provinces. There are 12 of them. Um, and each province has something called the Human Rights Commission. And it has human rights tribunals, mm -hmm. which are led by a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And these, these, this was a, such a good idea at the beginning. They were meant for ordinary, they're fairly informal. They don't cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So ordinary citizens who felt that they were being discriminated against in some way because of they were a minority in some way, you, they were a woman or they were an immigrant or they didn't speak English very well, or they were disabled or something, had a place to go mm -hmm. to, to ask that they be treated properly. Mm -hmm. So the lawyers in charge of them, you know, are inclined to do good. Mm -hmm. And these tribunals had been hearing cases by so-called transgender women mm -hmm. already and had been ruling in their favor. Mm -hmm. So it was a combination of the provincial human rights tribunals latching onto Bill C-16. Mm -hmm. And some, of, some people have said Bill 16 only formalized what was already happening province by province. Mm -hmm. But... Since Bill C-16 was passed, um, the federal, uh, there was a federal part of the government that was known as the status of women. It was kind of a government department, but it wasn't given the title of a government department. But it was the status of women and their job was to ensure that women in Canada were being properly addressed and dealt with. After Bill C-16, C-16 came into effect, that became a department. It was raised up to the level of the department and then its name was immediately changed. Mm. It is now called the Women and Gender Equality Department. Mm. WAGE, Women and Gender Equality. And it is, um, I'm just looking for, I, I think I'm not gonna be able to find it right now, but its mandate mm. is to ensure the equality of all genders, including women. So women are no longer a sex class. They are one of many genders. And recently, they were the department through which several hundred thousand dollars of federal money was shunted to two SLGBTQI plus groups. Um, across the country, hundreds of thousands of dollars. There was an announcement that these were being distributed to a whole bunch of groups that we might as well call trans groups because that's the only thing that they deal with, mm -hmm. you know? But WAGE, the department that is supposed to be concerned about women, was used to funnel all this money to trans groups. Right. And, and, since Bill C-16 was passed, the government has changed its definition of women. Formally, it is on the government website. Mm -hmm. The definition of a woman, anybody who identifies as one. 
That is the government's position. So these are the repercussions of Bill C-16, which looks like a fairly innocuous document, just adding gender identity and gender expression, you know, and, and some provisions in our hate crimes legislation. You know, it, somebody convicted of discriminating against a trans person can also be accused of a hate crime, and that um, adds extra time to their punishment. Mm -hmm. But this, uh, there is a conflict that's been that has not been addressed and that is canada has both the human rights act and it has a charter of rights and freedoms mm -hmm. and the charter of rights and freedoms is part of our constitution mm -hmm. the charter of rights and freedoms has not been changed and it prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex hmm. not of gender mm -hmm. so these sound and, like they're directly in conflict then yes Unless you think gender and sex are sort of a mixture of the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and women's groups, I mean, since 2015, large numbers of women's groups have sprung up in Canada to deal with all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and gender dissent, you know, it mm -hmm. came on the heels of that as well. Um, Women's groups are waiting, are waiting to make a charter challenge. And that is a means of fighting against this by saying it violates the charter. Nothing is permitted to violate the charter because the charter of rights and freedoms is part of our constitution. But apparently it takes six, seven, eight years to do a charter challenge. Vancouver Rape Relief, which is the only mm -hmm. um, domestic violence and and a shelter for women across the country that still excludes men from many of their services, um, they had to do a charter challenge because they, a trans, a quote, trans woman, unquote, wanted to become a counselor there. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, sorry, we need women counselors for our women victims. Mm -hmm. um, and that person, tried to force the issue and Vancouver Rape Relief went and did a charter challenge and it takes so many years. Mm -hmm. So we're, you know, I personally am really frustrated by this, but I'm not a lawyer and I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but somebody in Canada, you don't follow Twitter, right? Do you know Just Dad 7? No. Just Dad 7 on Twitter. He follows um, uh, government and legal stuff regarding so he's a good resource for you, it sounds yeah. like. He's and unfortunately, from my point of view, he is he he runs he does long Twitter threads, but he has started his own Substack mm. and he's uh, publishing things on Substack. I would love to have him write for Gender Descent. Mm. Um but he wrote a lengthy thread about um the fact that you simply cannot change the meaning of the word of any words in a in a legal document, you know, and the charter of rights and freedoms has the word sex in it. And so the gender ideologues, they want to change the meaning of the word sex, right? To mean any gender, right? right. But his argument was that legally you can't, when, when you have something established in law or in the constitution, you cannot simply retroactively change the meanings of the words. And so that is um, something that a charter challenge would would address mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it, we're all just waiting for somebody that they they want to make sure that it's a good enough winnable issue mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um i mean we're all really really frustrated about the fact that that this hasn't happened yet because until somebody decides to do that we're all stuck with this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know gender id is the policy it's not the law of the land there is no law in canada that says men can be women and women can be men it's simply bill 16 the provincial human rights commissions and policy policy rather than law however this idea of misgendering if i was living in canada and you told me that you wanted to go by he and him and all that my understanding was that if you and i had been friends for a long time and then you told me joey you know i go by he and him now and my new name is bruce or whatever and i'm like yeah okay and then i introduce you to my friends and i by accident i say she 
can you do anything legally against me in front of all of these people as witnesses that and claim that I misgendered you? Could you get me in trouble with the law for that? It might be somebody could argue that that violated Bill C-16. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So and if you didn't now... like me and you really, really wanted to get me in trouble and you had everybody else on your side about that, you could make an issue of it. You yes. could make a stink about it. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. And the Canadian Bar Association has a 2SLQT plus branch. And it has um, been arguing that any it, it, for any legal procedure, people should be required to announce their pronouns before the procedure starts. And they're lobbying, lobbying now the Supreme Court of Canada for the same thing. You know, and that means that if if somebody is um, being charged with rape mm -hmm. and the woman that he raped is a witness, of course, in, a, in any rape trial, she would have to address him if he said, I'm a woman, she'd have to address him as she. And Which is what is we've insane. seen already happen, right? We've seen yeah. this already happen in the UK. Yeah. It's, it's oh, just awesome. Ay, ay, ay. Um, thank you for all that explanation. One of the things I wanted to ask you about, you know, here in the United States, um, the casting upon anybody's head that is questioning any of this gender ideology, and we're doing it publicly. And of course, any of those of us that have the privilege at this point to show our faces and our names and all that, that the narrative that gets cast upon us is that we must be getting money from, quote, the right wing, you know, and that we are uh, Christians or some sort of religious zealots and we're being privately funded and we're homophobes and blah, 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 blah. And then we're cast into that whole thing that we are also, of course, here in America where everybody loves to just see black and white, um, that we're probably Republicans or worse, you know, this, this whole notion. Do you have the same kind of culture there in Canada when you're talking about left and right politics? And have you yourself been accused or, or anybody that you know been accused that's fighting gender ideology, that you must be getting right-wing money, you must be conservative uh, Christians, or you know anything like, like what we experience. Well, we're tarred. We're tarred in the same way, tarred and feathered in the same way. And it's without any knowledge. I mean, nobody has ever called up the women's groups that I belong to or gender descent and said, hey, you know, what's your political orientation and who funds you. I mean, nobody asks these questions. Mm -hmm. They simply tar and feather us all because there are some members of the, some farther right-wing parties who, who are also fighting against gender ideology. You know, a, a woman who is a member of a, a small far-right conservative party, I think it's called the CPP or CCP, um attended the protests mm -hmm. that a bunch of women organized outside of prisons mm -hmm. i don't know if you know that we had six protests on one day outside of prisons organized yeah. by heather Mason. You, you probably, yeah well um some fairly right-wing people attended those protests and participated in the protests mm -hmm. so that means that we can all be tarred and, fe and feathered right we can mm -hmm. we can be accused of being part of the far right wing mm -hmm. and and it's um it's completely without any foundation but uh, what we really saw this is what wokeism does and we really saw it in canada with the truckers protest mm. you know that millions of people protested in ottawa mm -hmm. a few months ago um some people were there was there were some people who organized this and some of the truckers were part of that organizing campaign but then you know a million ordinary canadians showed up and and were flooding ottawa and toronto and vancouver as well mm -hmm. and the the media labeled everybody for these are just far right extremists mm -hmm. you know and it's just what they do because they seem to believe so thoroughly that they're left-wing wokeism is not an ideology it is true it is kind it is just and anybody who is protesting against anything that it does must be from the right mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a handy excuse. It's just a handy excuse. It's unforgivable for journalists, mm -hmm. you know, not to investigate this themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that we have that in common for sure. Looking at your gender descent, not just as a website, but obviously a philosophy, a political movement, if you will, or whatever. Um, one of the things that we've been talking about, yes, this is very much Canadian. The writers you have talked about, you would like to have more submissions and things like that. How are Indigenous women at all um, engaging with gender descent at this point? And do you have any um, future plans for... You know, we do. I, I, I have been very concerned about getting Indigenous voices. I would also like to get Asian voices in because um, there are so many um, both East and South Asian immigrants in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, but the Indigenous situation we did is particularly important. And we did have one article about um, children in foster care being trans mm -hmm. by uh, mm -hmm. here in BC by a government appointed psychologist, Dr. Wallace Wong, who was bragging a year or two ago about how many children he had transed, you know, and, and a majority of those children were in foster care. Mm -hmm. And in Canada, the majority of children in foster care are Indigenous. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, they're totally vulnerable to influence and manipulation by anybody who wants to use them. Mm -hmm. So that was one of our first articles, and I have been very anxious to, to get Indigenous voices on our site. And um, it looks, I've had a, a promise by a prominent Indigenous uh, feminist, Cherry Smiley. Mm -hmm. I don't know mm -hmm. if you've heard I that. I do, name. absolutely, yeah. yes. Yeah. She runs a, an online women's studies course and is just completing her thesis for her PhD. Mm -hmm. And she's also moved back to BC, where she is originally from. And she promised earlier that she would, and I never heard anything from her, but it looks as though, you know, she was really busy. She was starting this moving process. Mm -hmm. But uh, we've made contact again, and she has again promised that she would write something. So I am looking forward to that. I've also, through an intermediary, I'm trying to get hold of Faye Blaney. Have you heard that name? No, I have not. She's another prominent, um, older Indigenous woman. Um, she has appeared on the American Conversation. Do you know that podcast? Yes, I do. Yeah, mm -hmm. she has um, spoken on that podcast. Um, so, I mean, step one, you know, I, I am aware of two prominent mm -hmm. Indigenous women who, mm -hmm. who could contribute, you mm -hmm. know, and, mm -hmm. and I've got a promise from one of them. You know, and if um, if anybody watches this podcast and would like to contribute, all they have to do is send us an email. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So there, because they are vulnerable, I think that they're targeted in the same ways, but it plays out differently. Um, um, and I really want to find out all about it. And I think mm -hmm. that we all need to find out. I mean, it, <clears throat> the indigenous issue comes up again in prisons because 42% mm -hmm. of women prisoners are indigenous. So there's our PM, Prime Minister, talking about um, finally dealing with indigenous people favorably and fairly after years and years and years, decades of injustice. Mm -hmm. And and he's introduced this bill that through snaking its way through government institutions is now subjecting Aboriginal women to sexual harassment and rape inside federal prisons, it, which mm -hmm. is just insane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Indigenous people need to be part of the conversation. We need, and I, I don't feel that it would be right for me as a white woman to be writing about the indigenous issues. You know, we need indigenous mm -hmm. people, indigenous mm -hmm. women to, mm -hmm. to write for us. <clears throat> and one of the last things that I wanted to ask you uh, about is moving forward. We are still, I'm recording this in April now, I think um, looking at the next three months, even through the summer into the fall. Do you have any projects specifically that you can talk about or a direction or anything about gender descent that you'd like to put out to the uh, to the audience here? 
Well, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> as of September, we'll be we'll have been in in business <laughs> for a year. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking. I'm I'm looking now at the authors and their proposed articles for the remaining time. I'm already starting to edit some of that work and, and in touch with people like Cherry Smiley. Mm -hmm. um, assuming that her article comes forward, that'll be um, posted sometime in May or June. And we're probably going to take a bit of a break in August. And we need to regroup. Um, we're tired and we need, with a core group of four people, that's probably enough to run the website, but we need we need more people on board, a stable of writers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we'll just continue um, advertising. Mm -hmm. We advertise on our website and on our Facebook page, and we occasionally tweet out advertisements looking for writers. This Canada is so spread out. You know, we're from coast to coast. We're as wide as the U.S. Mm -hmm. We have a small population that lives mostly just north of our border mm -hmm. and <clears throat> how do people from vancouver and toronto and ottawa and montreal and halifax let's say those are five major urban centers uh, well i'm forgetting calgary how do we connect with each other you know i in a way we've been well served by covid because zoom was created in response to covid and it is so easy to connect with people across 7,000 kilometers from east to west. Mm -hmm. um, that's just a guess. Um, without this ability to communicate online, it would be hopeless. You'd have a, a, a few women fighting in Vancouver. You'd have a few women protesting in Calgary. You'd have some women in Toronto, you know, a few women in the Maritimes. And we wouldn't be able to make contact with each other very well or very easily. Mm -hmm. So this is this is the the big issue in Canada is we are so big and we have such a small population and so few urban centers and we don't connect. Mm -hmm. How do we connect? And this is the advantage that they have in Britain, you know. Mm -hmm. It is so small. It is so small. Mm -hmm. um, so our goal is is to um, is to carry on, make it through a year, mm -hmm. um, have some rest and rejuvenation and um and carry on again trying to get more people to write for us mm -hmm. and more people aware of the importance of sharing this information it's it's really there is no media no mainstream media in canada that is covering this mm -hmm. and people ordinary people can't know what's right and wrong when the media is not covering it mm -hmm. Um, and so we have to open up our readership as well. Um, and that's hard in Canada because I think only 19% of Twitter users are Canadian. Okay. We have a very small percentage of our population that uses Twitter. And Twitter is where so much of the information comes. And they can reach us when we, treat up, we tweet out our articles and people can access them that way. But how, how do you make, you know, or an ordinary family in Regina, Saskatchewan, aware of our website so that they come to it from time to time to read it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We still have to develop a subscription. We don't have that. We have to uh, develop some way of taking in donations so that mm -hmm. we can maybe do things that require money, mm -hmm. you know, but we're just a baby at six months old, you know, and um, so we're going to continue to just plod along and try to do the best that we can, make sure that all of our articles meet certain standards mm -hmm. and um, keep trying to fling our net out there to get more readers and to get more people who are willing to write. Mm. Do you know, have you tested out whether or not your website is being blocked in other regions of Canada? Can everybody access? Do you know, have you reached out to, uh, to test that out? It's like an earlier conversation you and I were having about, I was telling you that I'm able to see some YouTube, you know, videos of things that have gone on in Canada that you can't, that have been banned there, that you don't even know about it. And um, I wondered if you've actually checked to see with somebody outside of your area, can they actually access gender descent? It's something that I was wondering about the moment that I saw it. 
I'm sure that people all across Canada can. And and our members live, you know, live from coast to coast and in between, mm -hmm. and the people who are writing for us. So of of the eight or ten people who are associated in some way with gender descent, they live across the country, okay, all over the place. Yeah, well, that's good. That's good. Too. And we don't, we don't, we do not have an internet censorship bill yet, although they are trying to push one through, and that could be absolutely terrible. Yeah. Um, it would censor um, pr pr private communications, I think, uh, anything that goes out on the web, I mm -hmm. guess not private, not emails, but mm -hmm. um, anything published on Twitter or Facebook would be subject to censorship based mm -hmm. on um, our hate laws, based on, I mean, Canada is not an absolute freedom of speech country and I'm not an absolutist when it comes to freedom of speech you know we Canadians know that if you shout fire in a crowded theater um, and some people are injured in the rush to leave that you're liable you know the person who shouted fire is liable to some degree so we, we do have laws um, preventing actual hate speech but unfortunately women are now the, the primary focus Mm -hmm. of investigations into hate speech simply because we're fighting it for women's sex-based rights right 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 so there is that black cloud on the horizon mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well felicia thank you so much for spending this time with me i feel like uh the audience is going to learn a lot about this i mean some of the you know more well-known canadians that i know the names get out there with heather mason and the pre and the prison issue Cherry Smiley, I've known about her for quite a while, um, and yet always feel like she can use, you know, more platforming. And Kathleen Lowry, you know, the, the anthropology professor that we spoke of, Linda Blade, you know, yeah. Coach Blade. I mean, there are a certain number of names, but, you know, they're small. And the United States has a certain number of names, too, that get repeated over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. And out of the UK and all that. And my interest always with this channel is to get a wide swath so um thank you for being my first canadian i i think unless i'm crazy here <laughs> and uh well i i really appreciate you having me on the show and thank you so much and i encourage you to get linda blade on the show to get heather mason on the show to get more canadians on the show because we do have people who are doing excellent work and we had opened up talking about, you know, and you said about originally you were going to be working with what was going to become this global thing of the 11th hour blog, which later after that had a, a glitch, Jennifer has had now a global, you know, there are people reporting from around the world just to make that clear that is happening on the 11th hour blog. Well, thank you. And maybe we'll take a look, uh, revisit this after your year has come up as well. That would be great. Yeah. One year checkup. Okay. Thanks, Felicia. Thanks for all the work you're doing. Thank you, Joe.